All right, Book of Colossians uh, for Beginners, that's the name of the series. This is uh, lesson number five. And uh, today we're going to be uh, covering chapter one, verse 18 to verse 29. So if you have your Bibles, you can open them up to Colossians chapter one. So as far as uh, this, uh, uh, this epistle is concerned, we've established the idea that in this letter, Paul's theme is the preeminence of Jesus Christ. And uh, we've also uh, studied the fact that he is demonstrating this idea, you know, the preeminence of Christ, in order to combat false teachers uh, who were trying to formulate a new gospel or new teachings that somehow minimize the person and the work of Jesus on our behalf. Uh, so for this reason, he concentrates on the fact that Jesus is first or he's preeminent in every area of creation and spiritual life. And what he's trying to say to the Colossians with this presentation is, you don't need anything else. As far as your salvation is concerned, you don't need anything else. If you have Jesus, you have, you have everything. So last week uh, we started the section that begins in chapter 1 verse 3 and goes all the way to chapter 2 verse 7 where Paul demonstrates Christ's preeminence in the area of relationships. For example, I, I kind of gave you an image there. Uh, in a chain of authority that stretches from God you know, all the way down to man, Paul shows that Jesus fulfills every link that permits a relationship between God and man. This chain, he says, begins with Jesus. You know, the first link is Jesus' relationship with God. That's the first link as His divine Son. And then all the links all the way down ends with Jesus' relationship with man, the final link as head of the church into which all men are, are called. So Jesus has, pre, has the preeminent relationship with God and the preeminent relationship with man as well as everything in between. So as we pick up today's lesson in verse 18 of chapter one, Paul is going to continue to establish the idea of Jesus' preeminent in relationships. Now, in the previous section, Paul listed Jesus' credentials as to his position in relationship to everything as seen from God's perspective, not, not man's perspective. I'll give you an example of this. Uh, he's the image of the invisible God. He's the firstborn of all creation. Uh, this is what Paul was saying previously. Uh, he is the power behind the creation. Uh, he is the reason or the purpose for the creation. He sustains all of creation. Uh, he uses all things in creation for His purpose and then finally he mentions he's also head of the church. So Paul was talking about you know, Jesus' credentials and he describes these things in those terms. Now in the next section he's going to explain why he has the right to hold these positions in our eyes, not just God's eyes. So Jesus has all of these preeminent positions and there's a reason why. In the eyes of God, Jesus is God. He's part of the Godhead. He needs no justification for His position. Since we are human, however, and we can't see things from God's perspective, God gives us a reason to believe and accept Jesus' preeminent positions from a human perspective. And in verses 18 to 23, this is what Paul is going to be explaining. Why Jesus has the position that He has and, and how we can see that from man's perspective. All right, so let's read verse 18a. He says, he is also head of the body, the church. That's where we left off last time. Paul gives the final link in Jesus' chain of authority. He's head of the church. In other words, Jesus has the preeminent relationship with man because he's, a he he's the head of the church. He's the head of the body into which all men are called. That's his relationship with man. Now for what we're going to cover today, he goes on, 18b, he says, and he is the beginning, the firstborn from the dead, so that he himself will come to have first place in everything. So Jesus is head of the church because of his resurrection. Okay? Why is Jesus the head of the church? Because he's the one who resurrected first. 
We read about that in Acts 26 verse 23. It says that the Christ was to suffer and that by reason of His resurrection from the dead, He would be the first to proclaim light both to the Jewish people and to the Gentiles. Why should He be the first? Well, because He's the one that resurrected from the dead. Why should He be the head of the church? Why isn't it Peter? Well, because Peter didn't resurrect from the dead first. It's Jesus that resurrected from the dead. Therefore, He's the one who's the, um, who's the head of the church. So he's preeminent with all of the previous things mentioned because of his resurrection from the dead. Um, his resurrection is the proof that, that they needed to see in order to believe all the things mentioned that they couldn't see. You know, that he had a relationship with God, that he was the power behind creation, that he was the purpose for creation and so on and so forth. We can't see those things. You know, we can't see those things. God can see those things, but we can't see those things. So Paul is saying, so God has given us the resurrection of Jesus to help us believe the things that we can't see, because we can see the resurrection. This was seen by human beings, and we have the witness here in the Bible. So if we see the resurrection, you know, that's something we can, we can experience and, and men have seen, then it gives us the proof that all the other things that Jesus talks about or that Paul talks about, these things are true, uh, true as well. So his resurrection confirmed his preeminence in every relationship within time, from creation all the way down to the church, and within eternity. Uh, not only backwards, you know, uh, he was there with God, he was there at the creation, you know, there head of the church, resurrected, but also into the future, into eternity. He has preeminence in the eternal nature, uh, the eternal sphere um, as well. So verse 19 and 20, he says, for it was the Father's good pleasure for all the fullness to dwell in Him, and through Him to reconcile all things to Himself, having made peace through the blood of His cross, through Him, I say, whether things on earth or things in heaven. So Paul repeats, this time with a little more detail, what he has said in a very compact way in verse 18. He says, let me just, I've just listed them here, that Jesus was divine. Okay. He's already said he's the image, he's the firstborn, he's the power of creation. Those are all ways of saying he's divine. I mean, who else can be equal with God? You know, who else can be the power behind the creation? Who else can you know, resurrect from the dead except the Son of, uh, except the Son of God? Now he also mentions uh, the method by which he became the head of the church in verse 20. Uh, he paid the price for our sins, that's the redemption. He uh, provided proof that He is the Son of God and that His payment was accepted. How? Through the re, uh, uh, re resurrection. And then He purchased something for us. In other words, His resurrection accomplished something. What did it accomplish? Well, it accomplished the reconciliation between man and God. Man and God were separated because of sin. Jesus dies on the cross to pay the moral debt to to remove that sin. He resurrects from the dead to demonstrate that his payment was accepted, right? You know, you buy a car or something and, and, and uh, you don't really have, the, you know, and you pay it off until you have the title, right? Until you have the title and the stamp paid off and, and the payoff letter from the bank, you don't feel good about that. And if you neglect to get those things and try to sell the car that you know you own because you paid for it, and, and the guy at the title company will say, where's your payoff letter? <laughs> where's your title you know, stamped paid off that you're the owner? Oh, well, the resurrection, okay, that's the payoff letter. That's the stamp that says, all sins, paid in full. And what does that buy us? Well, it buys us reconciliation. We can now be reconciled to the Father once again. So the redemption, the resurrection, and the reconciliation, this is what gives Jesus the right to be the head of the church. Why? Because no one in the church could accomplish these things. Now remember, keep an eye on the false teachers and their doctrines, because the reason for this letter is to, you know, is to address some of the false teachings that were being taught um, in that church. 
So Paul takes great pain to explain why Jesus is the head of the church and thus why their allegiance should be only to Jesus and no one else. So what is left unsaid here is how inadequate and unworthy these false teachers are to try and take away Jesus' preeminent position based on what, he has, uh, what He's done for it. There are, these false teachers are stepping in and saying, no, that gospel, you know, that's not complete, and you need to do this, you need to do that. We're the ones you need to listen to, and so on and so forth. So Paul is saying, hey, these guys don't have any right to say that, um, because none of them have died or resurrected from the dead. So they don't have a right to take Jesus' Jesus' uh, position as the teacher, Jesus' position as the one to give the teaching. Okay. So through His death and resurrection, Jesus has brought God and man together and has thus closed the full circle with His authority. So Paul again repeats the same idea, that's the style of his teaching. You know, he states an idea and then he'll state it again in different terms. So he again repeats the same idea, that Jesus brings God and man together by His cross, but this time He adds an important condition for this relationship to continue. And the important you know, uh, uh, ingredient for the condition to continue is faithfulness on the part of the church members. So in verse 21 we read, he says, and although you were formerly alienated and hostile in mind, engaged in evil deeds, so he, again, he's backing up and he's going to repeat, so now he goes back to the former condition of the Colossians. They were hostile towards God. They were guilty of evil. They were you know, unsaved. Verse 22, yet he has now reconciled you in his fleshly body through death in order to present you before him holy and blameless and beyond reproach. This is how Jesus accomplishes the reconciliation and what reconciliation produces. A transformation of sinners into acceptable saints before God. You were not acceptable before, uh, Paul says. You were sinners, you were alienated from God, ready to be judged and condemned. And because the, of the death of Christ and what it did, you're now brought back before God, but this time you're pure, you're sinless, you're acceptable to Him. Verse 23, he says, if indeed, and here's the, you know, here's the, the condition, if indeed you continue in the faith, firmly established and steadfast, and not moved away from the hope of the gospel that you have heard. Now the gospel they heard, what, what is that? Well, that's the gospel they heard from Paul, which they are in danger of moving away from because they're listening to these false teachers. And then he says, which was proclaimed in all creation under heaven and of which I, Paul, was made a minister. Just in case they don't understand which gospel he's talking about, he's talking about the gospel that's been preached from Pentecost forward by all the apostles who spread out and by himself, Paul, who's been preaching it to the Gentiles. So in verse 23, he, he kind of states the conditions for them to remain uh, reconciled. The first condition is uh, to continue in the faith. You know, when the Bible talks about faith, there's faith, you know, trust, uh, you know, have faith in Christ. You know, that means trust Him, believe in Him, you know, uh, you know, have hope you know, that His promises, there's that kind of faith. And then when they use the article, the faith, they're talking about the gospel, they're talking about the teachings, they're talking about the doctrines, that have been taught by the apostles. So here he says, they need to continue in the faith. Okay. Continue believing and teaching the doctrine of Jesus and the apostles. Correct doctrine is important because it preserves our relationship with Christ. You hear anyone say, you know, just off the cuff sometimes, you know, doctrine, that's not so important. Love is what's important, yes. And, and exactly what doctrine has taught you that love is important? It's one of many doctrines that Jesus has taught, of course. But it's not the only doctrine. Every time somebody kind of zeroes in on one single doctrine and raises it above the others, be, be very careful. Okay. Um, then he says also they must continue in the faith and they must continue in the hope. In other words, continue in your assurance, 
your confidence, your expectation that the gospel promises to you. And what does the gospel promise to you? What's the hope that you have? Well, your hope is you will be forgiven. Your hope is you will resurrect. Your hope is that you will have eternal life with God. Your hope is that you, whoever you are, right, Mary or John, you know, male or female, black or white, slave or free, smart, not so smart, rich, not so rich, big, small, tall, short, you will continue to be you without sin consciously aware of yourself as you are consciously aware of yourself now, but you will exist in another dimension where God exists. And you will continue to exist as you, without sin, in a relationship with God forever. That's the hope. So he says, continue in that hope. And it's amazing how many people in the world don't have that hope at all. The best they have is you know, to collect the, the greatest amount of toys while they're here and you know, they don't ha have no idea what will happen afterwards. But Paul is saying to Christians, you know better than that. You know you're only here for a short time. The hope that you have is for another life, another existence in another form, in another, uh, in another dimension. All right, so this here is a warning to them that if they abandon the teaching of Jesus and the apostles, they will eventually lose the blessings that come with the teachings. You know, that's why we have to be careful about doctrine. You know, I went to preach a meeting out in, out in Sayre uh, last week, that's why I wasn't here, and they, had, uh, you know, they asked me to send them some titles of my lessons, you know, and their theme was faith. Faith is the victory, that was the theme, and all the lessons dealt with faith. And one of my lessons said, the challenge of change. That was just the title, that challenge of change. And about a day later, I got an email from the preacher there, Billy Claybaugh, nice young guy. He, he sent me an email, he said, uh, if you don't mind, the elders would like to know what that lesson is about, the challenge of change. And I thought, good for them, those elders. They're paying attention. They're getting a speaker coming in. They don't know me that well. You know? And they saw the challenge of change. You know, change, what is it that you want to change? And of course, the challenge that I was talking about is changing, uh, changing your, your commitment to Christ. You know, uh, how it can be very challenging to go more, more deeply with Christ, you know, to become more committed to your faith and so on and so forth. I knew that, but they didn't know that. They're wondering what change is he going to talk about to our congregation. So they were doing their job. They were paying attention. What, what, what doctrine is he bringing us? Well, that's why doctrine's important, okay? And that's what Paul is telling them here. Now in the last part of verse 23, Paul creates another bridge. Remember I told you, he, he talks about something, then he drops a word or an idea that serves as a bridge to go from what he's talking about here into the next topic. So in the last part of 23, he creates another bridge that will help him segue from talking about the credentials of Jesus, which permit him to be the head of the church, okay, to Paul's credentials for being a minister or teacher of the gospel and a teacher of the doctrines of Christ. And the bridge word is minister. So he's, est he's established why Jesus is preeminent. Now he's going to establish why he, Paul, also has credibility in preaching Jesus' message as a minister of the gospel to the church. So the way that these uh, false teachers were operating may not have been limited to tampering with the gospel and the doctrines taught by the apostles. They may have also tried to discredit Paul as a legitimate apostle and teacher and minister. You, know, you want to break up a church? You want to, you want to you know, destroy a, a congregation? Go after the leadership. Create division among the, the elders. Create trouble in the leadership. Even if you have only two elders, if those two elders start crashing into each other, the effects, the, the, you know, the, the rumblings, they go all the way through the church. So that's, that's what they're doing here. Never mind just bringing a false teaching. Let's go after the, their main teacher. If we can take him down, it'll be easier to, to kind of take over, the, take over the group. 
So, <clears throat> excuse me. Uh, so this is probably what is going on here. Otherwise, uh, there would be no reason for Paul to review with them his own personal history and service and suffering on behalf of the church. Why would he do that? No need to do that. So in doing this, he's challenging his readers to compare his ministry, which includes suffering on their behalf, to the ministry of the false teachers, which is devoid of such commitment and sacrifice. So that's, this is where the switch comes in verse 24. He says, now I rejoice in my sufferings. You see how he just, boom, just turned the corner. He's talking about Jesus and Jesus' ministry and that word ministry, he pivots and he's going to talk about himself now. So he says, now I rejoice in my sufferings for your sake and in my flesh I do my share on behalf of his body. He's talked about Jesus' sufferings, now he's going to talk about his sufferings. Uh, which is the church, his body which is the church, in filling up what is lacking in Christ's afflictions. So he tells them that whatever trials he endures because of his work for the church, the church universal, he does it with joy as a minister appointed by God. He brings up the question of his suffering, not to complain, he's not whining here, but to make a point. The suffering in his life, he accepts it with joy. And he does suffer because it is his share as a minister to suffer a portion of the persecution that's directed towards Christ. Let's face it, they did everything they could do to Jesus, right? I mean, they, they undermined him, they discredited him, they slandered him, they, and then they got a hold of his body and, and they beat his body and then they crucified him and, and killed him, right? murdered him, right? They couldn't do any more to Jesus. And then he rose from the dead and you know, he's beyond them now. Well, uh, the they, the opponents, uh, they don't have Jesus to beat up anymore. So who are they going to go after? Well, they're going to go after the people who follow Jesus, especially the teachers who teach on Jesus' behalf. And Paul was uh, one of these. So he's not saying that Jesus didn't suffer enough to pay for sins. That's not what he's saying. Uh, uh, Paul now has to make up for some of that suffering. You know, he's, not, he's not saying that. Jesus didn't suffer enough, so I'm here to make up for the suffering that he didn't do. That's not what he's saying. When Jesus said, it is finished on the cross, he meant that his sacrifice was complete. The work of redemption was complete. However, the evil, the persecution towards Christ, this is not going to be over until the end of time. And the ones who bear it are those who follow Him. That's what he talks about in Matthew 5, 11 and 12. Those who are persecuted, you know, blessed are those who persecuted. This is what Paul is talking about here. So Paul says that as a minister and especially an apostle, he has to bear a greater share of the suffering. I mean, at the time he was in prison because he was seen as a leader in the church. So he says, I'm not suffering you know, because I'm a bad guy or I've committed a crime or I've done something dumb. I'm suffering because of what I'm preaching. I'm suffering because of Christ. And Jesus said to me and to all those who suffer because of Him, blessed are you. Blessed are you. So He said, I'm, I'm blessed because the suffering I'm suffering, it's because of Christ. So um, uh, he says that as a minister, and especially an apostle, he has to bear a greater share of this suffering. Now in verse 25 to 27, keeps going. He says, of this church I was made a minister according to the stewardship from God bestowed on me for your benefit, so that I might fully carry out the preaching of the word of God, that is, the mystery which has been hidden from the past ages and generations, but has now been manifested to his saints to whom God willed to make known what is the riches of the glory of this mystery among the Gentiles, which is Christ in you, the hope of, uh, the hope of glory. So that they won't get the idea that his ministry is just suffering. He's not some sort of martyr. Uh, he clarifies what his ministry is so that they'll see that his suffering is brought about by his ministry and not the other way. You know, he's saying, my ministry isn't suffering. My ministry is preaching the gospel, but because I'm preaching the gospel, I'm suffering. That's the, that's the order here that's taking place. All right? He's not a monk. He's not a, you know, he's not, he's not a masochist. So Paul reminds them of his spiritual uh, role among the apostles as the one who preached the gospel to the Gentiles. That's his ministry. So this gospel, this mystery, would have never been known had it not been revealed by God. 
And this revelation would never have come to the Gentiles had God not specifically chosen Paul and sent him to preach specifically to the Gentiles. And this revelation is that God offers eternal life, you know, that's hope and glory. He, he uses different words to describe the same thing. Hope, glory, eternal life, you know, all of that is just talking about the same thing. So the revelation is that God offers this eternal life to all, Jew and Gentile, on the basis of faith in Jesus Christ. There's no more information left unrevealed. And here's my point and the point he's making. Contrary to what the false teachers are saying. The false teachers are saying, oh, Paul's not giving you the whole picture. There's some stuff here he's left out. And Paul is saying, no, 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 no. The, the mystery that has been revealed, Christ dying, we're, we're saved by faith, both Jew and Gentile. You've got the whole thing. There is nothing left to reveal. Verse 28, 29. We proclaim Him, admonishing every man and teaching every man with all wisdom, so that we may present every man complete in Christ. For this purpose also I labor, striving according to His power, which mightily works within me. So His purpose in His ministry is to bring every person to the point of salvation and final reward in Christ. This is what he strives for, and he knows that his work and effort is in accord with the power and will of God within him, and whatever success he has, he attributes uh, to the Lord. Again, there's an unspoken challenge to the Colossians to examine the work and the motives of the false teachers within their midst. And so in this section, Paul reviews his qualifications or his credentials as a teacher, so that they can compare these with the ones put forth by the false teachers. So let's kind of summarize this a bit. As far as he is concerned, he sa as far as his credentials, he says he shares the sufferings of Christ. In the same way that Jesus suffered in order to establish the church, Paul suffers because his ministry on behalf of the church, you know, he's suffering because he's trying to establish the church and he's suffering because of that as well. Secondly, he's appointed as a minister of the church. God has appointed him. Paul was chosen by God to carry out the special ministry of preaching to the Gentiles, you know, his road to, the, road to Damascus experience. And he ministers God's word. The apostle gives to the Gentiles the entire content of the revelation about Jesus Christ that God has provided him. He's not holding anything back. There's no secret stuff that he's hanging on to. He's told them everything that they need to know. So the false teachers who do what they do for profit, because in those days you know, there was a, a system where different teachers and philosophers went from place to place for money and spoke. All right? uh, we're not sure exactly the motivation, which of the motivations, but it was one of the two, power or money. Um, they have appointed themselves to the positions that they hold and they teach things contrary to or in addition to the revelation of Jesus. So uh, they're no match for Paul when he compares his credentials for ministry with their credentials for ministry. You know, he's appointed by God, they appointed themselves. He's teaching the revelation he received from God, they're teaching stuff they made up. He's suffering because of what he's doing. They're, they're profiting by it. So this ends the section you know, in our outline dealing with the preeminence of Christ in relationships. Paul explains that because of Jesus' position in the Godhead and behind creation and over the church, He is the preeminent relationship in every area of existence. In other words, everything that is, is connected to Him first. God is connected to Him first. The creation is connected to Him first, and the church is connected to Him first. You know, you want to do something about global warming? I don't want to get political here, but... You want to do something about that? Absolutely. Recycle. Absolutely. Don't, you know, don't throw away your motor oil into the, the drain, you know, and into your... You know, just common sense things you know, to help manage the creation, but you really want to do something about global warming, pray to the individual, pray to the one who's connected to the creation first. He has the power. Not, not, I don't mean eliminate 
you know, common sense, good uh, management of the creation. But just that without prayer, not enough. Not enough. And so Paul shows Jesus' preeminence in everything. Then he shows that by virtue of his calling and his ministry by Jesus, he also is a preeminent teacher of the church. Not in comparison to Jesus, in comparison to the false teachers. Okay? So next time we're going to go on to the following section um, where Paul is going to explain that Jesus' teachings are preeminent in doctrine. So we've done preeminent in relationships, now we're going to do preeminent in doctrine next time. Now there's some lessons here that we can draw from this particular section, just some common sense things that come up from the text. Lesson number one, the methods of false teachers are always the same throughout history. Time and culture, these things change, but the false teachers use the same tactics throughout history. It's always the same thing. First, let's displace Jesus as Messiah and divine Lord. Let's kind of you know, undermine that idea. Okay? Um, in the Muslim religion, we've mentioned this before, there's a place for Jesus there, but He's not the divine Son of God and He's not the Messiah. He, he's respected as a teacher, as a prophet. Well, that's nice to respect Him as a teacher and prophet, but that's not who he was. I mean, he was that in a sense, but you know, he, he's also the divine son of God. So one religion tries to establish itself by saying that Jesus is not the son of God. Because if they would admit that Jesus is the son of God, what, what need do we have for Muhammad, for his words, for his teachings? We don't need his teachings. We've got everything that we need from Jesus. So in order to establish one religion, you have to undermine who Jesus is, and that's what they do. Um, um, in Jude uh, verse uh, three, just want to show you a, a passage here. It says, Beloved, while I was making every effort to write you about our common salvation, I felt the necessity to write to you appealing that you contend earnestly, listen, that you contend earnestly for the, there's the article, you contend earnestly for the faith, that means the doctrine, which was once for all handed down to the saints. How many times was it given? Once. Was it going to be stretched out through history? No, once for all. In other words, the apostles and the early writers of the Bible, they provided all the doctrine that we need. There is no more. There is no more revelation to come. And so that kind of undermines or supports the idea of how people undermine how false teachers operate. They deny Christ or they try to pervert the doctrines of Christ. They either add or change the gospel and the teaching of the apostles. They add new rules or new revelation or new conditions. Okay? So that's always you know, that's always been the method that false teachers operate to establish new religions or to kind of pervert Christianity. Um, number two idea, the gospel produces everything that God intends. Everything. God wants people to receive Jesus Christ and be saved through Him. Once we are united to Christ through faith, and that faith is expressed how? Through repentance and baptism. Once we have that, we are eligible for all of the blessings of heaven. We don't need to do anything else in order to be the recipients of all the blessings of heaven. Our, our not problem, but the process is that we begin to understand what these blessings are with time. Okay? Many people, you know, when they're baptized, uh, the realization that they have is I'm saved or I'm not going to go to hell or you know, the bad things, the sins that I did, I'm forgiven, I'm okay with God. You know, they have that concept, which is fine, that's good. That's, you, know, you want people to understand that, but they may not fully understand exactly what it is that they have. You know what I'm saying? It's like you get that brand new fancy computer, right? And you use it for email. 
just email. You don't realize everything that that thing can do. And you find that out you know, with time. Oh, I didn't know, oh, whoa, wait a minute. I can, I can make a document, I can, I can decorate it, I can draw with my hand on the screen, whatever. You, know, you find out all the features with time. If you're me, you're still emailing, you know what I'm saying? But, well, it's not the perf, obviously the perfect example, but Christianity is like that. We, we, we're saved, oh boy, I'm a Christian. You know? And then you begin to realize as you go on, as you grow in the knowledge, how? <laughs> through the teachings, through the doctrines, you begin to realize what it is that you have here. Okay? So what produces that? The gospel does. You don't have you don't have to have another baptism or another rule or, or something to receive everything. It's like that computer. Once you've got the computer, you've paid for it, you've got everything. It's got everything on it. Well, once you become a Christian, you've got everything that God has given to you. The, the, the thing that you need to do is to begin to unwrap and begin to understand everything that He's given to you through the gospel. And if you are curious, you know, well, what are some of the things that I have? Read Ephesians chapter one, uh, all the way through and you will see Paul outlines a lot of the things that we receive as Christians. So the point is there are no other conditions, no other mysteries to learn, no other uh, uh, messiahs that are going to come. Once we are in a relationship with Jesus Christ we are safe forever. That's what Paul says in Colossians uh, verse 28. Let me just read that to you. He says we proclaim Him admonishing every man and teaching every man with all wisdom so that we may present, present every man, how does he say? Complete in Christ. Every man he wants to present, every person will be presented with everything that they're supposed to receive from God. That's what Paul is trying to do. Equip them, tell them all the features that they have in their Christian faith. And then the third lesson, is that um, suffering is a normal part of Christianity. You know, we wish it, I'm not talking about you got a sore knee you know, or suffering that is brought upon by age. I'm not talking about that kind of suffering. Whether it's suffering the withdrawals of the flesh when we deny it the sin that it craves, right? Or the persecution by the world of unbelievers because we stand up for what we believe is true and right, or the burden of fatigue and inconvenience as we give up self in order to serve other people, the closer we are to Christ, the better we follow His example, the deeper our commitment to ministry in the church, and then the greater our discomfort and suffering in the world. The more you withdraw from the world, the more suffering. So don't be surprised. And don't be discouraged when it happens. Do like Paul and James. Consider it a joy to suffer some of the same kinds of burdens that Jesus suffered to save our souls. Because when we're suffering in the name of Christ, that's when He's closest to us. That's when we're closest to Him. That's where the joy comes from. The joy doesn't come from the suffering. The joy comes from being close to the Lord. All right. That's our lesson for this morning. We will continue this process next week if the Lord is willing. Thank you for your attention. Read that Ephesians 1.1 there. You'll, uh, you'll enjoy that.